Love this podcast? Support this show through the Acast Supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give and there's no regular commitment. Just hit the link in the show description to support now. Hello, this is Anita and this is Black Menopause and Beyond. Now, it's been quite busy for me recently because it was menopause month in October and I just had loads of things on, loads of events. Um, I organised a few events. So it's been a very busy time. The conversation of menopause is growing. The change is happening. Older women are receiving, well, well, we're trying to receive better health care. And as part of what I do, I do this podcast when I can. And within today's podcast, I have an interview I did with Pamela Windle. And she is a health expert. She focuses on the topic around um, alternative support with regards to menopause. And that's her profession. So you'll listen to her interview in a moment. Now, this podcast is actually sponsored by the charity Wellbeing of Women and Holland and Barrett. Holland and Barrett have created an initiative to provide better menopause health care and to help increase the dialogue around menopause for ethnic, not ethnic minority communities. And they have sponsored this podcast. So I, I wish to thank um, Holland and Barrett and the charity of Wellbeing of Women for that. And yeah, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead now with the podcast. <laughs> Hello, Anita. Thank you so much for inviting me to your podcast. Um, so t- tell us a bit about you. Yeah, so me. So I'm Pamela. I live in Nottingham, <laughs> in the middle of the UK. Most people are in London, all the exciting things happens in London. But that's the beauty of social media. I've been able to connect with like-minded women like yourself. So yes, so am I. So I'm a, I'm a mother, um, a sister, a friend. Um, I'm not a, a child to anybody anymore. My, both my parents have passed on um but you know that's an interesting thing being my age and you know and having been an orphan and my mum used to talk about being an orphan when she was here and and I kind of know what she means really so yeah so that's who I am what I do is that I work with women really broadly when it comes to their health particularly in the perimenopause and menopause journey yeah and I also deliver training in organizations consultant to organizations and also part of the BSI the new document that was released for uh, organizations around menstruation into menopause for workplace so I was an advisor to that which was really exciting as well that's really really good thank you for that how did you kind of fall into your job that what you do now yeah I mean it's been seven years since I've been talking about menopause um and back then there was nobody talking about it and nobody listening either lots of eye rollings in terms of the way I speak about it so it started really for myself in 2014 so I'm 57 now and still perimenopause and my eldest sister started having hot flushes in 2014 when our dad had died and looking back now clearly it was the stress of it all that brought that on for her but I was unwell with chronic fatigue and I'd lost my job as a result of that and my background sort of health and fitness I've been a personal trainer a degree in psychology and sports science and at that point I was working with dependent drinkers so I lost my job due to chronic fatigue syndrome and I was literally housebound for five years so I couldn't take care of myself so all the stuff that we take for granted you know cutting vegetables up that used to wear me out making the bed was a challenge brushing my teeth didn't brush my teeth every day uh, certainly not twice a day um life was really really difficult you know money I was literally bleeding money out and not very much coming in but in 2014 when my dad had passed away um I remember seeing my sister with these hot flushes and thinking oh my goodness me like I know what that is that's the menopause you're four years older than me she was 50 about 52 I think then and I was thinking oh my gosh and that's going to be me in x amount of years and I'm going to get old and I'm going to look ugly. I'm going to have these hot flushes and I'm going to get fat. That's all I knew about the menopause because that's literally what the society told us. Um, so I started reading about it and I just read, the first book I read was um, Dr. Oz. I don't know if you remember, he used to go on Oprah. 
Yeah, I, I've got a few of his books, actually. Yeah, so I started reading his book. And what he was saying was about oh, liver health and, you know, detoxification. I was like, well, how come women don't know about this around the menopause? But I hadn't heard of perimenopause until 2015 when a friend of mine invited me to a Facebook group. Who and In the Facebook group, there was like other professionals like um, physiotherapists and personal trainers and whatnot. And so she invited me to into, into the group. And the, the, the person that ran the group was called Jenny Burrell. And she was created a course around, she called it Third Age Woman, around that transition into menopause. And it was a really broad course, nutrition, bone health, pelvic floor health. And I, what I learned about nutrition from my personal training days was so different. And so obviously I was 47 at that point. Um, and I guess at the start of my perimenopausal journey, looking back. So anyway, I did the course literally laying down because I was so sick. But then because I went to university as an adult, I went to university at 39, I was still in that kind of goldfish bowl when I just wanted to learn more, learn, keep learning. And so then in 2016, I then trained in functional nutrition, which is what my qualification is now in terms of a woman's health coach. And if I hadn't done that course, I wouldn't be here today because I'd still be poorly because the medical system, you know, I went to the GP with chronic fatigue. Um, and they they didn't have anything to offer me apart from antidepressants or say, oh, and next you're going to develop, you know, fibromyalgia, you know, and you're going to have this for the rest of your life kind of thing. Um, yeah, you know, there, there isn't there isn't a solution for anybody that has fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue in the medical model at all. So, but you cured yourself then? Did you? I healed myself. Yeah, I healed oh, you're myself. a magician. <laughs> Well, I have healed many women as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, exactly. That's good because as a, as a listener, because sometimes when you when you talk to people about health and, and fitness and things like that, especially nutrition, I mean, they, they look, normally they look really well, good skin and whatever, but based on your, your lived experience, you know what you offer can have a major impact and change because that, because it changed you, basically. So... Yeah, so that's quite good. That's very good. Yeah, it. I I didn't. I remember being at home and almost thinking about ending my life. It was so bad. Yeah, it was so bad. I couldn't work out what was wrong with me. I did not know. And my mum kept saying to me, "Let me buy. Let me put, give you some money and you go and see a private doctor." And I was like, "Well, what are they going to say? They had nothing to offer." So my training comes from America. And functional nutrition is the umbrella, oh, sorry, functional medicine is the umbrella of functional nutrition. And so we come from like this tree. So the tree, so the branches of the tree, all the body systems, the endocrine system is in there in terms of like hormones. That's in there. You've got the digestive system, digest, digestive um, system. You've got the cardiovascular, skeletal, lymphatic system. You've got your immune system. All of those systems all work together underneath the roots then is the actual you know the things that's causing the problem yeah the symptoms that we're experiencing so for me the major symptom for me was fatigue that was the biggest thing along with other things but the biggest thing was fatigue and I would sleep sleep wasn't a problem but I just it felt like I was walking in treacle, really. So when we got to the root cause, I mean, I had brain fog. Like I'd never heard of the word brain fog at that point, actually, um, but certainly did have brain fog. And so when we got to the root cause, for me, the root cause was actually a virus called Epstein-Barr virus. So I do diagnostic tests part of what I did for myself and what I do with my clients as well and so we tested my hormones because we wanted to make sure because I was 40 I think I was 48 by then that it wasn't a hormonal issue or adrenal um, issue so my hormones weren't bad they were just you know they were pretty good for a woman my age I was still having a regular cycle and everything um we did some stool testing making sure there wasn't anything going on there any sort of pathogens or parasites you know that was causing it or like gut microbiome as well sort of bacteria in the gut and and then we did another test which is an organic acid test which I really love and I generally use for anybody that's got fatigue such as fibromyalgia because it can look at something called your mitochondria which is in mm -hmm. your body so your like internal energy factory for anybody that doesn't know what it means um and so we can look at that and it looks at uh, sort of toxicity, absorption of, you know, those foods that 
nutrients that support energy and brain function and mood and everything and so yeah there were some things that needed to needed to work on because I was 48 by the time you get 48 you know our bodies aren't perfect <laughs> and internally and um but there wasn't anything that was like yes this is why this woman is so sick so we did these tests did some nutritional changes some really good high grade medical supplements and then after three months there was a slight change but not big enough so we decided to look at my my blood and the first blood test that we did was called Epstein-Barr so Epstein-Barr is a virus that apparently 80 percent of the population have but for us as women it can reignite itself at any time when there's a hormonal shift so like postpartum so after childbirth or perimenopause yeah so that's what we we realized what it was it's the same family as glandular fever um but i didn't have glandular fever i've had flu several times but i don't know I had flu in 2012. We don't know whether it was that flu virus or flu virus I've had before. But I think being in perimenopause basically made that I was uh, really affected by it. Wow, wow. <laughs> That's a lot. And it's also quite, because you, you cover holistic medicine. Am I correct? Holistic. Um, but it's also quite good for me to hear that you understand the medical body if that makes sense, um, because sometimes holistic um, medicine deliverers or what they, whatever they're called, they don't actually use language which relates to the human body, um, but they tell you to take all kinds of amazing things and they tell you you can fly at the end. So for me, that's actually really reassuring in the fact that you understand how the body works um, and, and, and the relationship with what you offer in relation to the body on a, I suppose, a, not in the terms of medicine, but the medical implication and the medical illnesses and all that stuff. So that's really good to hear. Um, can you give us some examples of what you offer people? I know, I know you mentioned tests and things like that. Is it, is a lot to what, is it, blah, blah, blah. do you do a lot of assessment and kind of questioning and tests and then do guidance and signposting? Is that what you do? So I'm always looking for root cause. So whoever is sat in front of me, like, why are you sick? Yes, you might be perimenopausal, you might be postmenopause. Yeah, that's just one, that's just one system. Mm. So I'm looking at what else is going on. So I, I look at, uh, I take a really in-depth um, history, like, what was your mom's health like when she conceived you? Were there any stresses? Were you breastfed? Were you bottle fed? Were you born vaginally or was it cesarean? What child illnesses did you have? Did you have eczema? Do you have asthma? Do you have psoriasis? Because believe it or not, those those um, conditions can affect you in the perimenopause and the symptoms of those. If you put them side by side for a woman that has asthma, eczema, psoriasis and hay fever, they are like for like for perimenopause and menopause symptoms, literally mood disturbances anxiety depression problems with sleep palpitations problems with energy bloat problems honestly the list is side by side and so childhood illnesses kind of really give me a lot of indication of what's going on with that person that's sat in front of me and then like what traumas have you gone through you know has there been a separation of your family your mother and father when you were kids were you in a for us as black women you know were you in a family where you couldn't sit down and do nothing you had to be on the go all the time you know did you get whipped by the you know by a stick you know like kind of thing did you get beaten and it might be that our parents loved us clearly but it was traumatizing for us as kids Mm. yeah and then you know what happened at school you told you were stupid and you were thick you know and you believe that and then when you went into the workforce for you know what traumas did you experience there from being a black woman so that and then you have the pill and then you have antibiotics and then you have other conditions like endometriosis and so endometriosis um is now they're suggesting that it's an autoimmunity um and they're gonna have worse symptoms you know and I see many women that come see me and ask about their periods when they started and they go oh it was heavy and it's been painful has anybody suggested you might have endometriosis or adamitis and they'll go no right so often for women our age these things have gone undiagnosed and then PCOS as well 
you know, that's metabolic syndrome, she's definitely going to have a worse menopause because she's already got this unbalance of hormones. She's already struggling with weight around the middle. She's already at risk of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Never mind then the hormone shift. So I look at that, you know, detailed look at your lifespan, what's affected you during that time, heartbreak, the whole lot. Mm. Um, And then, you know, we don't always start off with testing. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we, you know, we just do some work around the trauma. Um, So I'm trained as a a hypnotherapist and NLP practitioner, and I do psychotherapy tools as well. So sometimes we do like some inner child work that, for example, just thinking of a client of mine who had problems with sleeping and we did some inner child work and, you know, that sorted her sleep out because she didn't feel safe. So often, you know, things like that can interplay with us today as women. Um, you know, and I also look at blood markers. So, you know, tests from your GP, cholesterol check tests, um, a blood sugar monitoring as well. We do that for, you know, particularly if you're on the crust of having um, type 2 diabetes, thyroid health, you know, all the vitamin Ds, inflammation, B vitamins, 12s. B12 and, and and folate so we look at all of those um so I read them in a very different way I read them so that that you're optimal rather than just in range that's what I do and then a guidance around nutrition targeted supplements lifestyle generally it's not very often I signpost to somebody unless it was something that I couldn't work with it was a path parasite or something I'd signpost to somebody that did that that's just out of my remit or a physical thing like I needed a physiotherapist or something more deeper in terms of emotional like you know rape or something like that then I would signpost to you know a therapist that dealt with that wow that's that's a lot (laughs) that's a lot a lot that's a lot to take in actually that's very holistic I mean how do you feel about some people who just to go to a doctor and take a tablet um i feel that if that's what she wants to do then that's fine however just taking a tablet won't get rid of the thing it just suppresses it so like you can have a headache yeah mm. and you can take a paracetamol but if you took a paracetamol every day that paracetamol is going to cause problems within your body so it's just suppressing the the problem the system symptom should I say but there could be many reasons why you have a headache you could be dehydrated you could have some food intolerances you could have hormone imbalances you might even need some structural work done you know around shoulders and neck you could be stressed so there are many reasons mm. That's medical the medical medical model is either to take a tablet to suppress a symptom or if it's something more serious, to cut it out. Whereas my training is to find the root cause, support all of those body systems, and then the body will heal. Like I healed, you know, and that's the thing. The healing didn't happen overnight. So a drug um, could make you feel that go back to the paracetamol, take away the headache straight away. But while we're looking for root cause, you know, it might take a bit of time for those things because we're using food we're using herbs we're using supplements we're using lifestyle some really simple things like exposing your eyes to natural daylight and that really impacts your energy levels and your sleep and your mood you know so it just takes time for it to work but it does work and when I say time no it's months three months but for me with the chronic fatigue that I had it was a year you you know what even though a year's long I actually think that that's still amazing that's, I think that's quick because um, I presume that you had a build up of issues that contributed to you feeling like that, which took time. So for you to do a complete turnaround rather than masking it a year, I would imagine is actually quite. Yeah, you're right. It does take time to be sick, <laughs> to mm. become sick so that it's at a point where it's debilitating and then five years still in it and not knowing what's going on. Uh, yeah, a year, a year. And then I remember going to the doctor in 2018 and saying to her, can you add to my medical records? I no longer have chronic fatigue syndrome. And and she said, well, tell me about that. What did you do? <laughs> and I was like, where do I start with this one then? Because mm-hmm. you're a doctor. You're not going to believe anything that I'm saying. Mm-hmm. That actually, it was all natural. You know, my gut, my liver, all the, all the other systems in the body 
Um, and she did, she did, she did add it, something in because your, you know, your insurances are affected by not having, by having chronic fatigue, you know, so I wanted it changing. Mm. Oh, that's good. That's good. Even, and it's also sometimes good, I think, for doctors to hear that there are other alternatives to them. <laughs> um, now, I mean, we have mentioned women of colour because um, you offer your service to everyone. Yeah, I do. that's yeah. So when it comes to women of colour, when it could be brown or black, do you sometimes tailor what you offer? And if you do, how do you tailor? I don't necessarily tailor per se, because every woman that comes to see me has her own unique journey. However, there are some similarities I've seen with the women that I've worked with who are of colour, particularly black women and sometimes age women. Yeah, there's this thing around the family. Okay. Yeah, the extended family um, in terms of the commitment that's that's put on them um, in terms of how in, in an ability to look after themselves because, you know, the parents need their support because they're aging as well. And it's like this guilt as well. So I see that a lot um with 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 black women and Asian women and again it's about creating healthy boundaries you know so as a coach and a therapist I help those women to create those boundaries and I don't really get that as much with with white women actually in terms of that guilt and um pressure from the family members um in terms of anything else there isn't anything really it's whoever I'm sat with you know the in terms of a black woman the things that she didn't have to explain you know I get it yeah it's a cultural understanding a cultural understanding and I suppose it's an element of feeling safe because they're disclosing some very personal information I don't I know how I feel I know how other women of color black or brown sometimes explaining your health concerned to someone who doesn't necessarily understand your narrative is a barrier for some women so even if there wasn't a biological difference culturally and emotionally a barrier is lowered for some women just by talking to you and it's not about racism it's just about comfort and feeling safe and you know they they look at you and they feel I presume an emotional connection that helps deal with all elements around trust and providing personalized services so that's that's good to hear and, and i do like to, i do mention that and i have mentioned that a podcast because sometimes people feel it's reverse to racism if a person of color wants to go to see somebody of color and i say no it's not it's not it's it's about safety it's about an understanding without having to explain um and for some women that's really important and when you're always the other or yeah. the niche or when you're never the default that gets to you or can get to you and it can be part of that stressor um, and going to someone where you don't have that as a stressor can actually relieve your 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 inner negativity am, am I correct I'm just making I'm just saying stuff but it's right isn't it you're absolutely right yeah it takes just one layer it's one thing we remove the thing that's stressing you out yeah you remove one thing and that is huge yeah yeah yeah, and I, I think that's really important sometimes for people to understand. It's not reverse racism. It's it's just kind of eliminating that other element and you're making yourself the default. In that room, there's a black woman talking to a black woman and you're not the other. And that, when you're a person of colour who was born in this country and you're half a century, I don't mean to rub it in, but you're half a century, that is a novelty. It is, isn't it? Yeah. It, it is. is. It is. Yeah. It is. Hmm. Well, just as we were talking about, um, you know, women of colour being with women of colour, you know, I was did a consultation this morning. Mm. I was speaking to another melanin woman and um, she thought, you know, it's interesting that you've not put it out there in the public domain rather than just going into people's inboxes. And uh, she said because she read a, something that's happened in America that a, a company, a charity, have been take, they've been taken to court by a white person who's saying that they've been discriminated about to because they can't, they can't have access to this charity. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that I've heard things like that before. And because I, like, I'm a community worker, I have to be so careful about what I say because, because, because that's my in, that's my job. That's how I get paid. I do. I work for charities and community organisations, but I cover loads of stuff, and I'm a signposter basically. So, yeah. um, so that's what I do, and I'm conscious of the fact that when I talk about black in certain spaces, yeah, that I have to say it in a way that no one can take it and use it against me professionally. 
because it has been done and say, well, why are you helping a white woman when you only care about black women? I said, Actually, I care about all women, all mm. women I care about. It's just that I understand the narratives of black women. Yeah. yeah. And I understand that there are additional barriers for black women, for Asian women, for women with disabilities, LGBTQ. Um, okay. But I also have the lived experience of a black woman. So it's very close to my home. And some of the things I talk about in relation to black women are my lived experience. Mm-hmm. So I have to explain myself because uh, my work around menopause is sometimes thrown back in my professional space that actually pays my bills. I mean, the thing is, it's that trust thing. That's what it is. That, that is such a major barrier. And that's it. It's that is such a major barrier. That trust thing, um, and that the community work that I do. I don't, with regards to menopause, I don't do anything medical. I just signpost, and I and and my job really is to know enough information to do a good signpost. That yeah. that's the information I need to know. But a lot of people I work with are lower social demographics, and mm. so many older women are experiencing menopause, domestic violence, menopause, breakup relationships, menopause, struggling to parent, menopause, poor housing, menopause, you know, mental health. And, and I can see it and I can, I can go, I can talk to a woman and I can see they're dealing with emotional trauma and but they don't know it. That's the thing. They don't know it. They can't afford to get private care. The GP ignores them yeah. and, and, I, yeah. and I can see their struggle and it's really hard to signpost because the National Health Service is rubbish and they economically can't afford to go to people like you. Yeah, so my dream, my dream is to have an app to support those women. And and so we could talk about the HRT thing because for me, those women who are, those women are low economic status, that are cleaners, that are carers, that don't have, the, you know, the access to good quality food, their bodies and HRT is not a good mix. Okay, I'm not surprised by that, to be honest with you. Yeah. I'm not surprised. I mean, because I, I, because I'm overweight, I know that, well, the doctor won't put me on HRT. I know that um, because I'm overweight, HRT don't go well together. You know? No. Yeah, and I've heard loads of plus-size women say the same thing, even though because you're overweight, you're more prone to get diabetes, you're more prone to get heart condition, HRT. The fact they won't prescribe HRT to people who are overweight, it makes, you, it makes me question what is in HRT. It's it, it's supposed to help you, but it but I'm not allowed to take it. Yeah, that's <laughs> that... that is. Because, because HRT. Well, the thing with being overweight is because you're likely then to have fatty liver disease as a result of that. So your body's going to be compromised in terms of detoxifying. So HRT, you know, you you have to detoxify estrogen out of your liver. That is one of the places, and also in colon. So if you're overweight it's your liver is going to be already compromised so then if you're not um detoxifying it well from the colon from the liver that means it's backing up then it's going to be a risk for cancer and the other thing is that fat also mm. produces its own estrogen yeah no. yeah so you've got then your own estrogen you've mm. got estrogen from the fat and then your liver isn't doing a good job of detoxifying estrogen and then your gut microbiome also isn't going to be doing a good job of detoxifying estrogen so the build-up of estrogen for you is going to be way too high and that's the risk women dependent you know how overweight you have to be in my opinion every woman that's slightly overweight shouldn't be on it to be honest and she's not having a bowel movement definitely not shouldn't be on it Mm. okay yeah okay not getting rid of estrogen out of your body it's backing up for your system causing growing cancer we need to poop I'm going to share with you. I poo daily. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you there. Um, so um, Pamela, we we read a lot in the news that black women have worse menopause symptoms. Now I know with regards to my job, and I'm, I'm a community worker. Um, um, I I don't know about the medical side because that's not my area. And I know when I come across women of colour, um, they appear to me to have worse symptoms, but I know they live they experience more social issues and social barriers. So I know that that increases their stress level. Um, but in relation to what you do, how, how do you respond to that comment that black women have worse menopause? Yeah, I, I have really strong views about it, to be honest. And like most of the time they go, what, where does this come from? I know where it comes from. It comes from America. However, my thoughts are, wouldn't it be better to say five out of 10 black women experience menopause or symptoms worse than their work counterparts you know like why why this blanket approach to one race 
or two obviously it was Hispanics as well wasn't it but why this blanket approach when it was one study done many many years ago is that the swan study you're yeah, referring to? Yeah. yeah um done a long time ago and yes the women that they did actually do the study on I mean the study itself was a good study the most I think the women were from a really you know sort of poor area of America and yes like you said those women are going to struggle but when we look at the female body and everything that she'd gone through all of the hormones that hormonal issues that she might have and histamine and mold and gut issues and the pill and you know the food that we eat today because it, most of it's full of antibiotics anyway and the meat that we have to eat and the, and the vegetables and the fruit sprayed with chemicals all of that how can we then say that one group of women have worse symptoms when we add all of those variables into the mix you know we've talked about endometriosis pcos histamine intolerance you know the woman that's itching that's histamine and then today i've read an article a study from the international menopause society that say you know what they call now um genital urinary was in terms of it's you no know, atrophy and dryness you know there's studies to say that it's to do with what micro or no, so to go with your microbiome in your vagina and also your gut and your mouth so you know we can't I don't think that we can unless we're doing studies with all these different variables are we asking black women you know have you been on the pill are we asking black women do you have endometriosis are we asking them do you have PCOS do you have histamine intolerance do you have autoimmunity you know unless we ask those questions and say this group has this, this group has this, therefore their symptoms are worse. You know, this is, this sounds strange. Well, it might sound strange to some people because I'm, you know, I'm a co-founder to Black Women in Menopause and Nina, wonderful Nina is the founder. She is the, the queen of Black Women in Menopause and I'm her, her, her elf. Yes, I'm her helper. But I actually kind of agree with you. And the reason why I agree with you is because I know that social issues have a major impact across the board on health, full stop. Yeah. So from what I can see, yeah, that the barriers that, that black women experience, which can worsen their menopause, are external. Yeah. But I'm not a medical person. So rather than say, I mean, black women might have more layers, but any woman can have more layers with regards to social inequality. Yeah. So you're not really addressing the social inequalities. You're kind of making, you're distracting from the thing that really matters, which is dealing with social inequality. Um, yeah. Um, but also one thing I'm also passionate about is they don't research us enough. So if they don't research us enough, I'm not going to rely on one research because I feel that that's a contradiction. Absolutely. <laughs> then, but then the other hand is, are we going to be part, part of the research? Are we going to participate? Because black women don't do that either. Because of trust. Yes, exactly. <laughs> because it, it's because of trust and also because of the systems that are placed with searching us are predominantly white middle-class university educated women who are being paid who but we as a community of women who as you say we have so many commitments we're expected to participate and not be paid we're part we're we're walking into systems where the people who are assessing our symptoms don't have lived experience yeah yeah and also when you do participate in research nine out of ten times they never come back with a feedback so and sometimes they don't even action anything from their research it was just research so actually okay, yeah. if you're suppressed if you're struggling if you haven't got much time and if you're economically disadvantaged why should you give somebody who's probably earned a lot of money two hours of your time and you don't see feedback exactly i agree it was there's an article actually that um, i've read recently that talks about black women asian women and hrt and that, you know, black women don't take it up or Asian women don't take it up. And it's like, oh, we, the advisors have said, oh, we need to target those people. But for me, I'm thinking, well, you're assuming that these black people, black women are stupid or thick, you know. Yeah. Like, what if they're, they've just decided they don't want to take it because they don't trust the system? Yeah. And, and the thing is that they medically should know that there were different. See, I'm not a medical person. I always tell people I'm not medical. I signpost. I, I haven't mastered my own health, so therefore I'm never going to sell it. But I'm very passionate that women go to good professionals. That's what my passion is. But I um, I was talking to a woman, and she was talking about collagen. 
and how black women they benefit from collagen it helps them age better she actually worked for, she was a nurse at the hospital and they age better but also this is what a nurse said yeah it also good collagen reduces incontinence issues so she said one of the perks of being a black woman apparently is your high level of collagen which i don't know which is true but it came from a nurse and i thought see that's the example there are differences yeah. there are differences there are differences but do you accommodate these differences when you do biological research there you are as a nurse are telling me there's a difference <laughs> they are and the other thing is like um our pelvic floor muscle has more fast twitch muscle fibers so i liken it to chicken you know you've got the white meat on a chicken which is a breast yeah. And then you've got the brown meat, which is the leg. So the brown meat is fast twitched fibers. So they're really fast. Yeah. yeah. So you see the lineup of 100 meters of the yeah. athletes. It's black people, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We've got more fast twitch muscles, fibers in our bodies. So the pelvic floor muscle has fast twitch fiber muscles. So if we've got more systemically, what does that mean for our pelvic floor health? Yeah. So yeah and then maybe that's what we they need to when they do research it's not just about asking questions it's about looking at the things um that we experience and it could be as you've said other ethnicities because white working class women experience all kinds of things which sometimes are very similar to black working class yeah because it's about economic dep- deprivation a lack of access to good services um and things like that so sometimes the issue isn't colour. Sometimes it's just deprivation. That's it. Yeah, yeah. so deprivation is a layer. And then you've yeah. got all the other things that I've talked yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes, yeah. So, But the research needs, to, if you want to understand black menopause, you need to have an understanding of all kinds of things, not just do a survey. Um, you know, did you get HRT from your doctor? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. I don't want it and it could be they don't want it because they prefer alternative or it could be they don't want it because they don't trust it yeah exactly and that's so that's saying that actually as a black woman because you don't trust it that means somehow that you're stupid and you don't actually understand the risks that you're you're putting yourself at you know (laughs) and I just think that would they say that if it was white women no they wouldn't they would just say that's fine so that blanket approach black women headlines that many people are talking about infuriates me so much because unless we've got the research and it's looked at pro- looked at properly we can't go black women enter menopause i'm 57 i had my last bleed last month okay yeah? so yeah what are you talking about <laughs> i know cause sometimes i do um uh, consultation but not in a medical term sometimes companies want to understand the patient experience from a low social economic group so i had a consultation where someone contacted me she said i keep hearing that black women have worse menopause but i can't see why <laughs> so i said you know what? i'm not a medical person but i know some stuff we said but also i said i'm not and i'm not mean to be demonized because i'm a large person as well yeah but i know that from what i hear bmi is an issue with regards to hrt yeah and black women have a high bmi on average yeah so maybe i mean, i don't know i'm not saying that that's the issue as a whole but maybe there are little things like that which are different that are having an impact and also the medication isn't tailored for the black body yeah 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 so that's maybe the problem it's poor research and the lack of understanding that's causing it yeah, um, that's not the first thing though you know um even like our thyroid health the markets for thyroid ours is different for black women it's slightly okay. like, yeah so so there's so many things that we don't know about ourselves so so many like vitamin d what is what is optimal vitamin d levels for us mm. sure. yeah we exactly. don't know yeah we don't know we don't know and there's so many black people walking around with deficiency especially during winter and we just they can't rely on the side of the bottle yeah exactly <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> so i agree with you definitely there um Subtle results, still you, but with fewer lines. Botox Cosmetic, out of botulinum toxin A, is a prescription medicine used to temporarily make moderate to severe frown lines, crow's feet, and forehead lines look better in adults. 
Effects of Botox Cosmetic may spread hours to weeks after injection, causing serious symptoms. Alert your doctor right away as difficulty swallowing, speaking, breathing, eye problems, or muscle weakness may be a sign of a life-threatening condition. Patients with these conditions before injection are at highest risk. Don't receive Botox Cosmetic if you have a skin infection. Side effects may include allergic reactions, injection site pain, headache, eyebrow and eyelid drooping, and eyelid swelling. Allergic reactions can include rash, welts, asthma symptoms, and dizziness. Tell your doctor about medical history, muscle or nerve conditions, including ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, myasthenia gravis, or Lambert-Eaton syndrome and medications, including botulinum toxins, as these may increase the risk of serious side effects. For full safety information, visit BotoxCosmetic.com or call 877-351-0300. See for yourself at BotoxCosmetic.com. There's a reason you always trust your gut. Your whole body's health depends on it. Did you know 70% of your immune system resides in your gut? Invest in your health with Seeds DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic. Get whole body benefits including gut, heart, skin, and digestive health from 24 clinically and scientifically studied probiotic strains and a plant-based prebiotic. Go to seed.com slash gut and use code 25GUT for 25% off your first month. That's seed.com slash gut, code 25GUT.